I grew up with this. And every time people talked about Ghost in the Shell, I haven't really had it mentioned before. I'm talking about the original Ghost in the Shell on the PS1. And in any video that was talking about Ghost in the Shell, they were usually referring to either the standalone complex, First Fault, I believe it was called, or the PS2 Ghost in the Shell standalone complex. Sometimes it would have been mentioned, but it's not like major. Get it? Please kill me. I don't know, it's not why. It's a fun game. It's not a lot. Like, it doesn't have that much stuff going into it. But it's still a fun game. And we're going to talk about it today. So the game came out in 1997. And it's mainly about fighting terrorists. Okay. The intro just gets you in in the action. Like, the music. Actually, no. Let's talk about the music for, for, for just a solid minute here. It's fucking banger music in every mission you're playing. Including the intro. Probably, in the, I believe, in the last mission as well it just shoots you with the intro music and it's amazing it's just techno music and it's cool but with all the fancy animations in the intro and all the cool scenes of the major in there you're not playing as the major so you're part of section 9 as the main story is and i assume if you're watching this you're at least familiar with ghost in the shell if not let me just fill you in so it's public security section 9 it's kind of like a anti-terrorist organization that's like working behind the scenes, tactical espionage, stuff like that. I might not describe it well because I don't really know exactly what it is. I know it's it's passed on all the time in the story. It's passed on as public security, but there are like way more than that. And you're playing the role of a rookie. That's part of the section nine now. And you see all the familiar faces and it's fun because it doesn't take inspiration from the movie or the anime. It takes inspiration from the manga. Actually, why am I? Give me one moment. Might as well just nerd out all the way here. This is cool. <laughs> but like, you look through the pages and you do see it when you watch the cutscenes. But we're not talking about the manga or the anime or anything like that. We're talking about the game. How does the game play? So as I said in the initial part where I kind of fumbled because I have no idea what I'm talking about. You play as the rookie and everyone is piloting the Fuchikomas, which are think tanks with AI in them. You basically have a lot of maneuverability in the game. You can climb up walls, you can... You, it's basically a Spider-Man game with guns. So it's very American. Imagine Spider-Man, but it's a robot. It has twin machine guns and a rocket launcher. <laughs> you have the ability to strafe. And I believe, since it's we're talking about the PS1 here, and you need to realize, this came out in 94. And back then, it wasn't standardized. Nowadays, you have twin analog sticks on your controllers and you can look around you. And strafing was pretty... Like, nowadays, it's pretty standard. But back in the day, it wasn't standard. You go back and play, like, something like... Okay, look, you, you, you think of Resident Evil or Tomb Raider. And you think of tank controls. This, this, it's funny because you play as a tank in this game. But you're, it doesn't feel like it. You have way more maneuverability. As maybe at the beginning you will be a bit shaky because you're not used to it. But how it works is basically you can strafe left and right with the bumpers. And the rest, Bob's your uncle. You can basically do whatever you want. You shoot with... Oh wait. I am playing this one on emulator. And before I say anything, no. It's legal. Have it here. Jap, copy from Japan. It works. It's on my disk. Did a backup. It works. It's mine. Fuck you. Where was I? Oh yeah, controllers. So I'm playing on PC on PlayStation game with a 360 controller. So... Oh, actually, no, this is not a 360. What am I talking about? <laughs> Xbox One. Yes. Now I'm just fucking around. <laughs> anyway, I'm playing with this. And I already know the button layout for both of them. So it's, it's kind of like here. I don't have to think about it, but I just do it. It's the exact same layout. But anyway, it's pretty self-explanatory. You shoot with square. You jump with X. And you shoot rockets. No, you shoot grenades with circle. I had to think this through because I'm having two layouts of controllers here, like translating something. But yeah, ironically, a game that you pilot a tank doesn't feel with like tank controls at all. It's very 
fast paced. If you learn to strafe, you realize that if you just spin around the enemy and just shoot them, it usually fixes the issue. It can get a bit more confusing sometimes when you're talking about going up walls and being on ceilings and stuff where your maybe vision is inverted and that kind of maybe will fuck with you if you're not used to it or not keeping track of where you are. But overall, pretty solid. It's taking the Doom approach where you don't necessarily, you don't actually know, you, you can't aim vertically. Basically how it works is if you're having an enemy that's above you, the game usually tells you it pans the camera slightly upwards and it doesn't matter where you are as long as you're horizontally aligned, it will just shoot up. It's kind of like how Doom used to do it. Yeah, that... Uh, I didn't prepare for this. As long as it's in front of you and it's like up or down, if you have line of sight with it, you can shoot. Or you just shoot a grenade and just explode and kills everything. It's pretty easy to get into it once you learn the basics, but the game really starts to ramp up its difficulty at around the fifth level. The game itself has 12 levels in total, so it's not very long. But level four, it kind of starts to test you. You have to destroy explosive devices and they're scattered around the map and you have a time limit. And you, when you do that, you need to go even on scaffolding and on like high places, you need to do a bit of a platforming. It's not really platforming, you don't really jump. You can jump if you want to, but it's easy to just climb on an edge and just walk across. But there are some exploding, explosive devices that are a bit weird to reach, so you might have to do them really quickly so that you have the time to do it properly. Then ninth mission, it really becomes more challenging. It just throws more enemies at you, you need to be a bit more cautious. And in the last level, it's a really pain. It's a real pain in the ass. The whole game doesn't really give you any platforming uh, besides the scaffolding that I mentioned, but it's not incredible. You don't need to jump across on like small surfaces. But what's annoying in the last mission is that there is one section where you can even see in the recordings, I failed a lot. And that's not even all the attempts that I had. A lot of, I had to remove all of them. It was difficult to measure how far you need to jump. Once you go past that, it's a bit weird because you don't. it doesn't tell you where to go. So a lot of the time you'll just look in the hole and just fall. But other than that, the final boss is pretty cool. So I'm not gonna, I mean, it's like a, it's a 97 game. So if you haven't played it so far, it's kind of a new. If you don't want to get spoiled by the experience, kind of like a small thing, but that's your warning. At the end, you fight you fight the big baddie in his own tank. And it's really like a very anime fight. He like goes around and just spins and shoots lasers and blades and stuff at you. And it's pretty challenging. Even like normally, the basic strategy on most of the bosses in the game is just to strife around them and just shoot. Either rockets or machine guns or whatever you want. But this one was difficult because you can't really strife. He kind of like shoots a bit forward, I think. I don't know what he does exactly, but he hits all the time. So you need to actively jump out of the way, which is cool. I honestly, I wanted, I would have liked to have that a bit earlier in the game so that you can at least feel like you're in danger. Most of the game you don't feel once you learn the controls and you kind of can cheese stuff. Not really cheesing, it's just like you using the spin to win strategy and just spin around them and shoot. So they can't really do much. But it's cool about it is after you fight him, <laughs> You think you won, but you don't. And then you have this really cool scene where you're, you're both falling. It's it's really similar. I don't know why. Maybe it's maybe it's the inspiration. There's the scene at the end where you need to kill the boss again in midair, but you have a time limit. And if you strafe, you just spin around and you see yourself falling with him and you guys like shoot each other. And it's really, it's funny saying this, it's really similar to the scene in The Matrix uh, when they like shoot each other in the air. Why I say it's funny is because Ghost in the Shell was the main inspiration behind the first Matrix movie. So seeing this really similar, because I, from what I recall, there's no scene like this in the original Ghost in the Shell movie. So clearly that was like a Matrix thing. But it's, it's funny to think about. But it's a really cool scene at the end. And I forgot about it. When I replayed this game now to, for the video, I forgot at, at about this because I couldn't remember how it how it finished. I knew about the tall building. I forgot completely about that aspect. I was like, yeah, I won and 
it just shows you on the building. It was like, what's happening? And then it eats you out. And I'm like, oh, okay. I yeah. forgot completely about this. And it's a cool scene. I don't know what else to say about it. It's just there. Now, in the looks department, it doesn't look bad. I think for, for what it is, it looks what you would expect a PS1 game to look. I don't know the technical details behind it. I don't know how many polygons they used on the touch commas assholes. I really don't know. What I do know is that it looks good. I never had issues with the frame rate. On, uh, sometimes on the hectic side of things when you fight bosses, sometimes it's it lowers the FPS slightly, but it doesn't feel bad. It's consistent. I think that's what I want to say. I really didn't prepare for this. Did I say Tachikoma or Fuchikoma? Because there are two of them. I mean, they're robot tanks. Spiders. Can't remember what I said. Fuck. It's the Fuchikoma. I don't know what else I said before. I... Uh, eh. And... Eh. I... Uh, I have taken notes. i never done this before. My teachers would be proud. In the second mission, they integrated the night vision. It's pretty cool. You don't have to do anything. It's just that when you go into a dark area, just switch to night vision. And... It's cool. It it looks right. You see, actually, it's even better sometimes. It it adds this really weird motion blur effect, which is often enough a lot of people, myself included, disabled. Mo uh, uh, uh. But here it looks right, especially when you know it's night vision. So it's like an, an overlay. It's like a a thing that you turn on. It's not supposed to look perfect. It's supposed to assist you. You you already have an advantage over your enemies in that at that point. Why am I explaining night vision? I don't know what to say, considering it's a PS1 game, and at that point, it's kind of hard to say that the game looks bad, because they kind of all look the same. I'm gonna have to get hate for this, if, but still, I don't care. The first Crash Bandicoot looked cool. Even Gran Turismo 1 looked cool, for what it was. Considering the limitations of the of the platform and how it works, how the console works, and how it shows, like, once you reach into the depths of how they used graphics, how do how, how like they they cheated the system to allow for higher resolution photos by just splitting the texture into two triangles or like four. I can't remember. I'm again haven't prepared for this. Not going for a lot of detail about what you do. The story is not really. I mean, it's there. It's there basically to deliver the whole game through it. So it's kind of simple and it's kind of similar to what ps1 did if, it, if it's not something like big like resident evil usually games don't really have a big story okay legacy of kane as well let's talk about that let's not talk about that it's another video for that i don't have legacy of kane on ps1 so i can't really talk about it if you want extra cutscenes and stuff you can get them by the training grounds if you get high scores you, you unlock cutscenes the animation style is really cool i, I really love these 90s anime I'm big into anime in the first place. So 90s anime is like, I grew up with that. They do a really good job at it. I believe they use the same voice actors in this game as they did in the movie. I don't, I haven't fact checked this. So don't crucify me if I'm wrong, but I believe so. They sound really good. Speaking about the dubbing, subbing, that debate. If you can get your hands off this on Eng in English, it's sure, cool, but you're going to pay a lot. This is the Japanese copy and you can see here, it's like kanji and stuff. I played it before in, in the English version. The dubbing is kind of like, eh. If you're not shielded, stay in your Fuchikoma. Everyone up top, we're going to cut off Zebra's command. Wait a minute. I'll take out the protective barrier. Go on. There's no time to do that by yourself. I'll help. No, you've got to back up the rookie. Huh? You heard me. I said, get going. It's fine. But it's, it's clear that, I mean, back in the day, what voice acting would you expect? It's very rare when you have a game that's like really articulated in the voice acting department. But it's, 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 it's passable. It's not horrible. But uh, yeah, the cool thing about the Japanese copy, because I didn't know this before recording this, I went and I wanted to get the footage for the video. And lo and behold, it has English menus. The whole thing that's Japanese in this game is the cutscenes. And that's about it. Oh yeah, and the covers and the thing, the box is Japanese. The manual isn't. The manual looks cool as shit, but obviously it's in Japanese. 
I mean, you can't tell me this doesn't look cool as shit. You don't need to speak Japanese to appreciate this. But if you can find the Japanese copies way cheaper, depending on where you live, it might be a bit more. But considering a lot of the English versions are really expensive, PS1 games are expensive in general. So I wouldn't really pay that much. I mean, Bob's your uncle. You can do whatever fuck you want if you can get it online. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you should play it. It's cool. I don't know if I did a review or I'm just rambling. I think it's a bit of both, but I don't know. I like Ghost in the Shell. I think it's cool. And I'm not really good at this. Thank you so much for watching. Here's a video that YouTube thinks you would like. It's a bit different from what I'm doing right now, but if it's there, it's there. You can watch it. I might just do another video in the future if I get a hands on the on the PS2 standalone complex game. I have a lot of my... Uh, I have a lot more games in my collection, so I'm probably going to do more of these if it's something interesting and I can tell a story behind it. Hope you guys liked it. Go play it. It's cool.